I was given sort of free reign on what I wanted to talk about, and so I, I selected insulin resistance, friend or foe. And I have it posed there as a question. So we're going to go through this presentation this morning, and I, and I won't guarantee that I'll actually answer that question. So I hope you, I hope you didn't come for an answer. First, let's just quickly go over the metabolic roles of insulin. Many of you are familiar with this. It facilitates glucose entry into cells, inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis, increases hepatic glycogenolysis, enhances fatty acid synthesis in adipose tissue as well as triglyceride synthesis, enhances uptake of triglyceride by adipose tissue, and it inhibits adipose tissue lipolysis. So much of the action revolves around adipose tissue and lipid metabolism. Insulin is not the only player in regulating adipose tissue lipid metabolism. So I'll acknowledge that right out of the bat, but obviously today that's where we're going to be focusing. So insulin resistance. I've sort of got the uh, insulin resistance for dummies definition up here. Normal concentrations of insulin produce a less than normal biological response. And again, if we had time, we could go into the different types of insulin resistance, differences in sensitivity, differences in responsiveness. But for the purpose of this morning's talk, we, we won't go into that kind of a detail. So how, how does this all pertain to transition cows? Insulin resistance is observed in mammals during late gestation and early lactation. Why does this occur? Well, again, insulin resistance causes less uptake of glucose by muscle cells. In adipose tissue, it decreases glucose uptake and decreases lipogenesis. And again, we mentioned this increases lipolysis. So basically, this is all done to help the cow out because it results in greater availability of glucose and fatty acids to the fetus and mammary gland, which are independent insulin independent tissues, meaning their metabolism is not strongly controlled by insulin. So it's all about creating availability of glucose and fatty acids to the mammary gland. So in actuality, it's something that cows purposely go through and it is done in, in the support of gestation and lactation. It is a normal biological process and a great example of homeoresis, that term that was coined by Dale Bowman and Curry back in, in the early 80s, which is the orchestrated or coordinated control in metabolism of body tissue to support a physiological state. One last point I'd like to make is this is not an all-on, all-off deal, all right? Many times we talk about it like that. Well, cow's insulin resistant during this time. Does that mean that she doesn't respond to insulin at all in adipose and how much? No. It's, it's a gradual, it's a, a continuum. It, it's not an all-on, all-off deal. So getting back to our question, is it a friend or a foe? So what I'm posing the question is, can cows become too insulin resistant? In other words, can there be too much fatty acid mobilization? And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Conversely, can you have too much glucose and fatty acid available to the mammary gland to support lactation? So you, you see where sort of this contentious issue can arise. Can we have too much fatty acid where it impairs the animal function? But yet, isn't she doing this to support lactation? Another question we'll talk a little bit about today, are overfed dry cows diabetic? The analogy has been made that they're like a type 2 diabetic. In other words, they have increased insulin resistance. Maybe they mobilize too much fatty acid. All right, so does too much insulin resistant equal too much NEFA result in a train wreck? All right. All right, so this is my 
attempt at levity. <laughs> As you know, David Letterman's getting towards the end of his reign on his night show. Certainly he's got to be running out of top ten material by now, so maybe we'll send this into him. But the fact of the matter is, right now it is very fashionable to be anti nifa Okay? Usually when Nefa are talked about, they're talked about it in a negative light. So here are mine, soon maybe to be Dave Letterman's. Top ten reasons. Depresses dry matter intake. Work by Mike Allen. Exacerbates insulin resistance. Some work that we did. Causes chronic inflammation. Decreases immune function. Increases oxidative stress in the cow. Perhaps decreases the risk of pregnancy. Decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis. Increases the risk of BA. Increases hepatic ketone production. And the number one issue is it may increase liver fat. All right, so there you have it. It's a pretty heavy lineup of things that you can find in the literature that basically condemn NEFA. So then I went to the flip side. I'm going to come up with a ten, top ten list of why you should love NEFA. Eh, I, you know, in reality, I struggled, but there's two pretty good ones. One is to provide energy for tissues, including the mammary gland, and to provide precursors for milk fat synthesis. All right, so the list, the list might not be quite as long, but, but they're high quality reasons. All right, so next is reducing insulin resistance, or in other words, I'm putting it in the context of decreasing NEFA, always, always better. And we're going to go through a, a couple examples here. By now, you've all heard of the controlled energy diets or the Goldilocks diet. This has been extensively studied by Jim Drakeley at the University of Illinois. These diets are characterized by being high in low quality forage. Typically, the forage that is used in these experiments is, is straw. Right. Again, the supposition is that these cows are less insulin resistant. In other words, if you overfeed a cow during the dry period, again, she may become a diabetic. And because of that situation, more insulin resistant. They mobilize too much fatty acids. So if we, un I won't say underfeed her, but if we feed her a controlled energy diet, these are typically fed to, to meet the animal's maintenance requirements, should be able to get lower rates of lipolysis, less fatty liver, and lower BHVA. And then I'm going to put a question mark there on milk yield. So here's an example. In this particular experiment, they fed a high straw diet. So this is a controlled energy diet. And this study was about 0.61 emicals NAL per pound. They also had a high energy diet. It was formulated to be around 0.72 megacals NAL per pound. They fed that diet ad libitum as they fed this diet, or they also had a third treatment, which was this diet, restricting energy intake by limiting the amount of feed that was offered to the cows. So here's the details of the diet. Again, when we go to this controlled energy diet, there's a high concentration of wheat straw present. So if you take a look at the data from this study, very, very characteristic of many of the controlled energy diets that they've run at the University of Illinois. Here's our cows that were overfed versus those two that were restricted either by diluting the energy or limit feeding. And yet, sure enough, you can see that the NEFA concentration is higher in those animals that were overfed, starting out a few days prepartum and then continuing on postpartum. This would be serum beta hydroxybutyrate. And again, as you might expect, with that higher NEFA concentration, there appeared to be greater oxidation or partial oxidation to ketone bodies and greater greater beta-hydroxybutyrate in the blood. Here's the liver triglyceride. We have less fatty acids in blood for the liver to take up on the restricted energy diet, so liver triglyceride is reduced. 
relative to those animals that were in fact overfed. On this graph, I've got milk yield during the first eight weeks of lactation. And you can see that with the heifers, there's basically no treatment effects on milk yield. When we go to the multi-parous cows in the solid line, you can see that those cows that were overfed produced milk with 3.82% fat and 86 pounds of milk, while the animals that were fed that high straw diet produced 3.53% fat and 73.3 pounds of milk. All right? And the p-value on this was about 0.10. So you start to scratch your head a little bit here. Mm, looks pretty good metabolically, but yet maybe not quite the milk yield in those multiparous cows. Here's one of the last studies that I did at the University of Wisconsin. We did this shortly after some work indicated that perhaps far-off dry cow diets are more important than close-up dry cow diets. So in this experiment, during the first five weeks of the dry period, we fed a diet that was either 0 0.60 megacals of NEL per pound or 0 0.70 megacals per pound. And then at three weeks prior to calving, they all went on the diet that was 0 0.70 megacals per pound. So this was strictly a comparison of basically overfeeding during the far off dry period. No changes in dry matter intake. Milk production, 95 on the, quote, controlled energy. The cows that were overfed had about 107 pounds of milk, all right? And that was significantly different. Now, perhaps unexpectedly, in this study, there was not a difference in fat percent. Come down to NEFA and BHBA, there was a statistical trend for higher NEF and BHBA on the animals that were overfed, but it wasn't a huge, huge difference numerically. But it, again, the, the question of, wow, gee, was, was overfeeding such a bad deal, all right? Now, I want to be very clear. The point of my discussion this morning isn't to condemn controlled energy diets, all right? While many of the studies have shown depressions in milk fat, and some have shown reductions in milk production. It's just not the typical response to reduced milk production. But my point being is, are there cases when perhaps we've maybe gone too far with the concept, and because of going too far with the concept, perhaps we paid a price in the production of the cow? Another interesting example I'd like to show you is um, at several Midwest universities, they created two genetic lines of cattle. One was a genetic line that was created using, quote, average semen available. And the other genetic line was created by using above average semen for milk production as the source of that line. And that was an experiment that, that went on at the point of this uh, publication. It had been going on for 20 years of genetic selection. Now, it's starting to get an old. Uh, most of the universities have, have abolished these lines. I think maybe Minnesota may still have theirs going. But this was work that was done at Iowa State University um, by Bob Harrison and, and Jerry Young and uh, uh, Al Bites, or Don Bites' group. If you take a look at milk production, here's, here's the difference that they got in these two genetic lines. Here's the high group. Here's the average group. Expressed on a fat corrected milk, here's the difference. So roughly about, what, four kilograms of milk production per day. Now if we take a look at energy balance of these two genetic lines, the solid line here is the high group. And you can see right out of the gate, these cows are in greater negative energy balance. All right. Well, part of that's because they are making more milk. The other side of the equation is, is that these cows right out of the gate that were genetically superior weren't eating more feed. Now, gradually over time, they did. It became significant at week five after calving. But these genetically superior cows didn't, didn't pay the freight by eating more feed. So 
Where's beta hydroxybutyrate? Here it peaked at about 16 mg per dl for the high group. Here's the average group at about 11. Same thing, NEFA, high group, higher NEFA, all right? So this is just another example that, you know, maybe, maybe high NEFA, high beta hydroxybutyrate is part of high milk production, all right? Again, which goes contrary to, to some of our thinking. Now, whether some of these differences between these genetic strains were due to insulin resistance or not, and differences in, in their capacity to respond to insulin, I don't know. But this is work that was done by John Roach's group in New Zealand. He developed two different strains of cattle, both Holstein Frisian, one in which he termed from New Zealand ancestry, the other from North American ancestry. Here is their milk yield, about a three kilogram difference in favor of the cows in the North American ancestry line. He did a glucose challenge to take a look at, you know, insulin sensitivity per se. This was done at five weeks after calving, a little later than I'd like to have it done, but in fact when they did that, the fractional turnover rate of glucose after the glucose challenge was slower. Looking at it by half-life, it was a greater half-life. It was being cleared more rapidly in the genetically superior line, suggesting that maybe, maybe there's actually greater insulin resistance in, in your higher producing cow. Okay, I want to change gears just a little bit here and talk about niacin, all right? Now niacin, you know, it doesn't involve insulin, okay, but it, it's similar to insulin in that it's an anti lipolytic compound. It suppresses lipolysis. So this is a work that was done at the University of Wisconsin by actually my, my last graduate student who I saw his face in the audience, Carl Wan. And in this particular trial we had 30 cows. Half of them were on a control treatment. Half of them were fed a ruminally protected niacin. Had 12 grams per day. This product about 67% nicotinic acid, so we're delivering about 8 grams to those animals that were supplemented. The diets were fed from 21 days before expected calving through 21 days post-calving. Here's the NEFA concentration. At three weeks prior to calving, at 1, 7, 14, and 21 days after calving. And yep, if you can get niacin through the rumen and can get it into the bloodstream, it's a pretty potent antilipolytic compound. You can see the reductions in, in blood NEFA. This is liver triglyceride concentrations. Cows were biopsied at 1 and 21 days after calving. You can see in the dark bars here, those fed the rumenly protected niacin had lower liver triglyceride. That makes sense, right? Lower NEFA, lower liver triglyceride. Although I will make the comment that these differences were not statistically significant. Let's take a look at energy corrected milk. At one, two, and three weeks after calving. Now, I'll admit the scale is probably not, you know, a little bit deceiving. It starts at 25. So the reduction isn't as big as it might look in the back of the room, but it was, it was a pretty big drop. It was about 9 kilograms of energy corrected milk in the first week. Right. Suggesting that, again, we weren't perhaps providing enough NEFA to the mammary gland for optimal milk and milk fat synthesis. So, in the year 2004, I was at the Nottingham Feed Conference put on by Peter Garnsworthy, and every year after the conference they publish the proceedings in a book. And Dr. John Newbold was there, and he presented a presentation, Liver Function in Dairy Cows, and it was actually one of the best presentations I ever saw. And then when the uh, proceedings came out, there was uh, what I think is a very profound statement by Dr. Newbold. He says, nutritional restriction to adipose tissue mobilization might be necessary. But there is a philosophical problem. We have selected cows that have increased reliance on mobilized body reserves as a source of nutrients for milk production. 
The farmer has paid the geneticist for this. Are we now going to ask him to pay the nutritionist to work in the opposite direction? We have our priorities wrong. We should explore what can be done to help the liver deal with the mobilized fatty acids before considering whether we need to try to reduce the amount of fatty acid supply to the liver. Boy, made a lot of sense to me. Up until that point, I'd spent my whole career trying to figure out how to block fatty acid mobilization. You name it, I looked at it. I'd looked at niacin. I'd looked at chromium. I'd looked at insulin injections. I'd looked at shortening the dry period. I'd done a number of things, all in this attempt to block fatty acid mobilization. And then John Newbold basically tells me, hey, you've been all, all off base, buddy. That's not where your priorities should be. OK, so if we take a look at the schematic here, we've got our adipose tissue. We've got triglycerides. We have certain signals around the time of calving and during negative energy balance that cause that triglyceride to break down. The glycerol and fatty acid, they enter into the blood. We know about 25% of those fatty acid mobilized are taken up by the liver. We'd like for them to be completely oxidized to CO2. We'd like for them perhaps to be a sterified, re-sterified to glycerol and export it as a VLDL to send that fat to the mammary gland. But unfortunately, these pathways become overwhelmed at times of intense fatty acid mobilization, so the cow is susceptible to stored fat or fatty liver and production of ketones, and sometimes excessively. So what Dr. Newbold has said, yeah, well, yeah, we may, we may have situations, but should this be our first priority? Maybe our first priority should be to get those NEFAs that are brought to the liver get them channeled through the liver and get them delivered to the mammary gland where they can use it for fat synthesis for an energy source. Okay, so potential strategies. Here would be your antilipolytic approach. Again, I've worked with them all, niacin, propylene, glycol, and chromium. And there's evidence that they can work. Here's the one that says, well, let's work at the liver. Let's, let's get that liver to accept that fatty acid and process it through. Get it through, get it incorporated to a lipoprotein. Choline, when fed in a roomly protected form, the meta-analysis we conducted shows that, yeah, you can get maybe another 2.6 kilograms of energy-corrected milk per day by getting that fat processed through the liver, in addition to lowering the amount of fat in the liver. Maybe, maybe we should employ a combination. Maybe we should attack the cow with antilipolytic compounds prepartum because we know there's a gradual rise in NEFA and a spike in NEFA at calving, so maybe we should have the antilipolytic compounds working then. But as soon as she calves, as soon as she initiates milk production, let's, let's get them out of there. Let's not suppress lipolysis. Let's let it go. So we could use that as a prepartum tactic. Postpartum then come in with something that increases hepatic export, but also probably feed that compound, namely choline prepartum, so that it's in the cow's system when that C surge in NEFA occurs on the day of calving. You know, these kind of strategies make a lot of sense to me. This is a combination strategy that, quite frankly, hasn't been looked at yet. That is something that perhaps we should. I right, have some questions for you to think about. Are elevated NEFA and BHBA always bad? Yeah. You know, we, again, lately when I hear presentations, read popular press articles, even journal articles, boy, it's so many times the connotation is that they're bad. But are they, are they always bad? And with that, does a one-size-fit-all cutoff for NEFA concentration or beta-hydroxybutyrate concent beta concentration for an alarm level always serve us well? You say, well, if you're at 1.2 or 12 milligrams per DL of BHBA, it's, you know, wow, there's your cutoff point. Beyond that, you're going to get reduced milk production. 
I, I mean, I don't argue with the data. I think it's great data that's been generated largely uh, here at Cornell University. But does one size fit all? The question I would ask is, go back to those low and high genetic potential cows. Maybe they have different cutoff levels. I mean, I, like I said, I don't have all the answers. I'm, I'm just here kind of raising the questions. What do you tell a dairy producer if too many cows, maybe 15%, are above the alarm level, testing too high for NEF and BHA? But he says, man, my cows are milking like crazy. Mm. Wow. Do you come in and start doing things to try to suppress NEFA mobilization so you get those levels back in line? How, how will you manage fat mobilization? Something for you to take away from the presentation this morning. How, how, what strategies will you use? For example, what about ideal body condition score? Man, talking about a pendulum, when I started in this business, it was 3.5 to 3.75 at, at dry off. Now I'm hearing 2.5, 2.75. All right, that pendulum has swung dramatically. And why has it swung dramatically? Oh, you don't want to have too much fat there to mobilize. That's bad. That's bad. If you want to keep that cow healthy, keep her thin at calving. Well, maybe, just maybe that ideal body condition score varies depending on how you manage fat and fat mobilization. Maybe we can have a higher body condition score if we give the cow something to aid that liver in processing fatty acids from getting the adipose tissue to the mammary gland. Just a question. All right, lastly, insulin resistance, friend or foe. I told you at the beginning of the talk, I wasn't probably going to answer that. And I'm not going to give you an answer because I don't think it's obviously black and white, right? I'm not going to sa stand up here and pretend to tell you that we can't get into situations where, yeah, oh wow, fatty acid mobilization is just too great and we have to do something in addition to helping that liver out. It can occur. There's no question that it can occur, all right? It's not a black and gray issue. It's, it's a continuum again. But my challenge to you this morning is to just think about it, all right? As you enjoy the rest of your breakfast, um, as you're on your plane ride or car ride back home, hopefully we've given you some questions to think about and think about this as an issue that, in fact, isn't all black and white. So with that, look. Did I keep it light enough? Good. I might. So well if, there, <laughs> if, if, there's, if there's time, I'll, I'll entertain questions. Any questions for Dr. The question is, if a cow is more insulin resistant during the transition period, would you expect her to produce more lactose? So, in fact, part of this insulin resistance thing, again, is to direct glucose away from, let's say, muscle and adipose tissue and get it directed towards the mammary tissue. And therefore, you'd have more glucose available for lactose production. Now, the lactose production, as would be argued by perhaps some of the data I showed you today, would stimulate more milk production. As I'm assuming your question is whether it would increase lactose concentration in milk? Okay, so the argument is yes. There are, in fact, benefits from having the animal perhaps become more insulin resistant. Good questions. But the one comment that I'm going to make, and I think that you were alluded that you were alluding to, Stephen, is it, in addition to this insulin sensitivity resistance concept as how it may affect hepatic gluconeogenesis, there's also that is to suggest that livers with less fat in it have higher rates of propionate conversion to glucose. So that also is a benefit of reducing the amount of, of fat in the liver. Again, I mean, I think your ideas here of twofold increasing fatty acid oxidation is good. Obviously, we think increasing VLD export is good. I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious, hopefully. I don't think anybody missed that message this morning. Um, but the, the question on fatty acid oxidation is actually a very interesting one. 
when I show my schematic and we can take that NEFA and have complete fatty acid oxidation, when I'm presenting that, I typically present that as we're only going to have so much capacity for you know, complete oxidation to CO2 because that's how the liver obtains its, its energy source. And so once, once the liver cell's energy source has been met, what, you know, why would you keep oxidizing fatty acids? Now, in other words, why would you keep producing ATP? Now, there is some evidence that says, well, there may be some uncoupling mechanisms so that rather than getting ATP, you can perhaps get greater oxidation and get heat generation instead. But, you know, I scratch my head and go, wow, you know, why, why do we want to produce heat? You know, that's kind of a waste as well. Um, there is some data that says that maybe we can maybe we can alter this fatty acid oxidation somewhat. We had uh, Heather White present a, an excellent presentation to a, a group of people yesterday in which she looked at some effects on fatty acid oxidation and, and the fact that methyl donors may actually be able to slightly enhance fatty acid oxidation. So there, there may be some, some dietary techniques, but overall, I think the, the concept that we're going to solve this problem by really jacking up fatty acid oxidation might be somewhat unrealistic. I don't, I don't know whether we can do it to the magnitude. Now sometimes small changes in rates end up being, having big effects on net production of things like triglyceride. But I, I think it's an interesting area of, of, of research, but I don't, I don't know whether we have all those answers. It's not such a secret. I, you're starting to you sound just like Tom Overton, okay? <laughs> Tom Overton always needles me, okay? Because, because, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. But, but he, he needles me because when I went to work for Ball Chem, okay? Because, because Tom did the first experiment using a protected choline in transition cows. And Tom remembers this. I don't, but I, you know, Tom's an honest guy. I believe him. <coughs> and according to Tom, I went up to him one day and I said, Tom, you know, so you increase VLDL output by the liver three times. Three times zero is still zero. So he, you know, he reminds me of that often, okay? So what can I say? I was wrong, okay? Uh, it's true. My first graduate student, Barry Kleppe, uh, was assigned the task of working with Lou Armentano's graduate student who was working with hepatocyte cell cultures. And I said, Barry, you go find out factors that regulate VLDL export by the liver. Because clearly that's a, a potential stumbling block in, in the development of fatty liver. And Barry did that. And how much time do I have? This is a great story. Five minutes. So, so Barry went into the lab and we were using goats as our donors, donor cell at that point in time. And he was, he was doing his incubation and he, he was measuring triglyceride export into the media from these cells and he wasn't getting anything. And he came up to me and said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting any VLDL production. And I, I said, Barry, you're doing something wrong. Go back. So he went back and he did it and he still didn't have any success. And I said, I said, Barry, Bob Bumble, the floor below us, they've got some guinea pigs. Go, go start knocking off guinea pigs rather than these goats <laughs> and see if you can get the system going on guinea pigs. And he comes up to my office and he says, well, Dr. Grummer, I can't, I, you know, these cells aren't producing any, any VLDL. <laughs> and I said, I said, Barry, you're screwing up. You're doing something wrong. Keep trying. Came back frustrated. You know, I was a new assistant professor. I was worried about tenure. I was saying, get your butt going. Get these cells to make VLDL. <laughs> so all of a sudden, he comes in about a week later with some papers showing that, well, gee, guinea pig liver cells have very, very low rates of VLDL secretion. And that's when the light bulb went on and said, well, maybe, movi maybe bovine cells are the same. Okay. So I said, Barry, go down to the basement of the building and get some rats. Okay. We know rat cells make VLDL. He went, got rat cells, isolated them, and they gushed out VLDL. They, 
they gushed out triglyceride. And that's when we discovered that, geez, these ruminant liver cells just have inherently very low rates of VLDL export. Now, sort of the common theory at the time was, well, that maybe that's because ruminant liver cells don't, aren't a major site of de novo fatty acid synthesis, so never they, maybe they never evolve the, the system to export fatty acids. Um, in our culture media, we had methionine. So I, you know, I said, there's methionine in there, we're covered. You know, we should be fine. Um, it was actually about 10 years later, Lou Armentano was doing some experiments looking at methionine metabolism in these cells. The amount of methionine we had in these cells was being gobbled up very, very quickly. So, so for a long time, I didn't even, you know, choline wasn't even on the radar screen. And I used to, I used to present to my class the analogy. He says, okay, think of the fatty liver as a car without gas. A car or a car that's stalled, isn't running. What are the options? There might be a mechanical problem with that animal. Or that that car, excuse me, I haven't taught in a long time. There may be a me mechanical problem, or maybe the, maybe the car's just out of gas. The out of gas analogy was that well maybe maybe there's a nutrient deficiency. the The mechanical analogy is well maybe in the liver there's there's something in in the genetics of the liver that you know the the, the right genes aren't being expressed to export VLDL. All right, and I always said I think it's something mechanically. I think it's something mechanically. But, but I think it might be partly gas, okay? And that, in fact, these cells are deficient in choline, which is needed for phosphatidylcholine synthesis and, and the synthesis and export of the LDL. Anyway, long story. Give me a couple of minutes and I'll go with it.